I'd like to introduce our first speaker today. He is Dr. Simon Atkins. How many of you remember Simon? No one can ever forget Simon, try as you may, except he has changed his hairdo a bit. He's gone the reverse of me. He had no hair the last time he was here. He now has a short, spiky hair, and he's going toward the Einstein look, he says, over a longer period of time. Simon is a climate economist and a commodity yield expert. I don't know how he came up with that title for himself, but it's brilliant because those are the things we will really want to know about and the things we can't control. When he does a PowerPoint, it looks like CNBC running there behind you, so you'll find that interesting. But he perhaps operates under the same philosophy as Garrison Keillor spoke about the Midwest several years ago. He said it's a great place to live, except for about five days a year when Mother Nature tries to kill you. That can happen in the future. The amount of radical change in climate, not saying climate change, but the fluctuations of it, appear to be greater now than they have been since perhaps the 1930s or the 1950s. Now whether or not Simon can explain all of that or not, he comes from an incredible background to be able to do so, and he watches very closely all of the trends that are going on in weather at this time. So would you please welcome our first speaker of the day, Dr. Simon Atkins. subtitle here to win, which is all about gaining abundance, it's not just money, but it can be health or joy. Follow your gut, not the herd. It's something that I call the awakening. We are going through a major shift. And let's be blunt, let's be very frank. Most of mainstream media is between flat out fabricated stories or just telling us lies. Now, with all due respect to the Des Moines Register this morning, it says, study, climate change could hammer Iowa ag manufacturing, and it goes on to say that soybeans and wheat yields, as much as 85% will be reduced over the next century. Well, that is complete bullshit. <laughs> all right? And I may be a speaker around the world that may introduce that term, which I find very colorful, especially where I'm living now in Uruguay. And it's an honor to be here with Susan because we actually represent this little table here with the exception of the Iowa boy sitting next to me. The Southern Hemisphere. I moved to Uruguay. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today, why I did that. So let's get into this and we're going to talk about the weather. And I am fed up and sick and tired of swimming around in the same damn bowl every day of my life. Look at the goldfish on the way. This is my day on Tuesday, I'm swimming around. Hey Charlie, hey Mary, how's it going? This is Wednesday, I'm swimming around, it's a little more urine. Swimming around Thursday, you get the point. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of hearing the same story every year. For 26 years as a climate risk economist, atmospheric scientist, all my geeky days, I've been hearing the same stuff every day. Global warming, all these nightmarish scenarios coming. And I realized I was this goldfish on the right, on the left. I have to jump out. I can't take it anymore. This is the awakening, and perhaps you're sort of grabbing what I'm saying here, is that I don't care if I didn't have lungs. I was going to do it. And what I'm going to take you on today is a journey about having been a goldfish and growing lungs and just going for it. So, this is the world connected. You'll see down there a hurricane in the bottom center and another storm in the upper left. 
beautiful thing that we realized was it's not just cold fronts or high pressure systems, it's actually magnetics. On the globe each day, there is 150,000 lightning strikes around the world every day. And thank God for that lightning, because if we didn't have it, there would be 400 mile an hour wind storms. That hurricane is connecting magnetically to the low pressure spot up there above. And that picture is August 1st, it was when I was on the QB2 coming over from England in 1980, a time where I never forgot it, that it caused 27 foot waves and they closed the whole boat down and I remember opening my little door in the ship and plates smashed and salt water were going through the alleyway. That is why I'm a weatherman and that's why I'm here today to understand these storms better. We are scared every day. We had bomb scares, you see the thing in Paris last week, we've got blizzards, disasters, lahars, whatever that is. Many don't even know what's truly important anymore. And how can we when we're lied to all the time? <laughs> Ken talked about how things are interrelated. The monarch butterfly. If you see in the upper left hand screen that little blue thing, this is our symbol of our company. A butterfly is metamorphosis. And this is the theme, I think, for the Land Expo 2015. You are going to go through tremendous changes this year. The magnetic planet that we live on is shifting. And this is why we're getting more and more extremes. If you see the green circles, climate change, weather effects, water scarcity. You think oil is important? You wait five more years. You wait till you see what's going to happen in China. I'm going to show you this today, what's happening. These are the number of disasters that happen around the world. And some countries actually have a higher risk profile. And here's my prediction. Over the next five years, depending on where you sit, whether you're in Zambia or whether you're in Iowa, you are going to have a certain cut on your economy. Now, this article says that basically everybody in here is going to go bankrupt. I don't believe it. I'm a lot more optimistic. But we do have to watch out for what's coming on. Now look, it's very simple. This is the weather pyramid. And it's a dynamic changing atmosphere, if you will. If you look on the bottom with the blue and the clouds, this is 70% of our weather. It's benign, partly cloudy, 72 degrees. It doesn't make a difference. I don't get into this because it's only 1% of the impact. It's not gonna bother you as a farmer. Then we've got 20% of the weather is volatile. And if you add 70 and 20, you get 90% of the weather only bringing 10% of the impact. So I don't bother with this. Why spend my time, my valuable time, and your valuable time, in talking about 10% of the impact? Let's concentrate on the big ones, and that's what I'm gonna to talk to you today about. So the lightning strikes, like Ken said, five days a year, that <coughs> could make your history or not, it could cause bankrupt. That's 7% of the weather. And then 3% of the weather, top, if you add those up, you get 10% of the weather is 90% of the financial impact. That's what I call the 1090 goal. Focus on the worst potential events. So when you're farming in each season, you're planting, you're growing, you're harvesting, the key theme that right down here is focus on the big picture. Forget the minutia. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what is happening. This is what Steve thinks about all the time. A paradigm shift. How is information shifting? We are going through new processes, new ways to do things. We have to achieve new results. And I'm very sorry to everybody that's writing about global warming. We have to make this shift to get these new results. So look, this is what you're showing. That 1960 or to 2060, this is going to be the planet. It's going to be a fiery hell. And everybody's going to burn in it, no matter what your church is. <laughs> Look at this. Where's the damn cold that hit Iowa last winter? 
And I realize this is 100 years forward, but realize something else. And they can't trick me, because I've been studying this for a quarter of a century. The global climate models do not use anything on the sun. They don't use clouds, and they don't use water moisture. So what the hell are they putting in these models? I mean, you don't have to be a meteorologist to understand that. No sun, no clouds, no moisture. And then you're making a decision on that model output? Give me a break. <coughs> now look, if it wasn't so freaking hilarious and serious, this would be funny. I was asked by the government <coughs> to be a part of this study. They want to take a little asteroid out in space, grab it, and explode it above the atmosphere to reduce cooling. So all of our lovely little children are going to seven year old and a nine year old in Uruguay, and they'd never see a blue sky again. This is serious. So have an open mind when I start to get a little bit crazy in about 12 minutes, right? And they're forecasting 85% reduction in soybeans. Think about who's the nuts, right? Think about who has the pole up there, you know what? Because this is crazy. And my reputation is telling it blunt around the world. I am sick and tired of us being told it. You know what's the truth. So I'm confirming it for you today. This is just crazy. We can't go on this way. So global warming, look, back in 1920 to 1944, the rise in temperature globally was actually more than it is now. But they don't tell you this because it's just not sexy. And look at this. This is from about 1900 to present. The last 18 years, temperatures have been falling. You know this. How many of you remember the 1970s winters in Iowa? You've been smoking too much something. I don't know. Not many people remember back then. <laughs> Look at this on the left hand side. This just came out just before Christmas. 2014, the hottest year in 134 years. Now you've got that memo, but they're setting you up. How many saw the second memo from my lovely dear friend here? My best friends are the ones I can never remember their name. This guy right here, he was questioned about this really being the hottest year of all. And he said the next day, in fact, two days later, well, what I said is only about 38% accurate. <laughs> Did you get that memo? No. This is what they do. It's like a damn bad used car salesman. You didn't get that second piece. So they push the fake report, and they pull back, apologize, or say, no, this is what's really going on. And then, nobody gets it. You still heard the first message. And look, time and time again, there's cover story after cover story. My favorite one is always Time Magazine. You know, I use that in the bathroom, not to read, you know what I mean? <laughs> Discover, Newsweek, all the same. They've almost been brainwashed and programmed to say global warming, or little polar bears, which are at a 40 year high right now. That's right, I've done the research myself. And so I've realized the truth. I'm not going to follow the herd. And how many would agree with me on this so far? Beautiful. It's better to walk alone than with a crowd going in the wrong direction. Here's my point. If you're going to follow the global warming report, you're in for a big surprise. I've got a friend, she's an IRS agent, she said, Simon, by the way, we only meet in a park. <laughs> I can't even tell you the park. She said to me, in 2017, you ought to see what's coming. They're getting us prepared for a little extra tax sheet where you have to put down all your miles flown, all of your rental cars, type of laundry machine that you use. It's all about energy, it's all about carbon. This is why they just announced in 2014, it's the hottest year ever, they're getting you prepped so that you have to pay a certain carbon tax. Listen, it's already happening in Europe and in Australia. 
Last year when I spoke at Top Producer in January in Chicago, I had to wear a bulletproof vest. And that's Chicago. I figure I'd take my chances, I don't need it today in Iowa. I figure, you know, you've got enough guns in the audience here, you'll protect them. <laughs> so, why did I have to wear that bulletproof vest? Because now, instead of hiring meteorologists and IT mathematician geniuses, I have to hire two people out of our 26 staff to be security agents. And you think I'm kidding here. Being a meteorologist going up against global warming is going against the big boys and a lot of money. But let's make something very clear to you today, and I look each one of you in the eye. I will never lose my line of integrity. When I almost lost my life, God told me one thing. He said, follow your heart. And instead of saying, hi, how are you in Uruguay, they go like this. I feel that deeply. I really do. It's amazing how much abundance comes into your life when you follow your intuition. And if your intuition today is telling you that this global warming is complete bunk, then you better believe your intuition and walk alone and win rather than going with the herd. This is really what's happening in America these days. This is why it's cooling so rapidly. It was below zero wind chill in Alabama a few weeks ago. Iowa is part of a few states that are cooling at 10 Fahrenheit per century. That's why it's getting so damn cold. That's why you had 12 below two weeks ago. So look, this is the truth. In the last 4,500 years, there's been 75 major swings. Up, down, up, down, up, and down. Back in the Hebrew Exodus days, about 2,500 years ago, there was a huge warm-up. In fact, it was so damn hot in Egypt, it was 135 degrees in the shade. They didn't leave because God told them it was too damn hot. They were scorching their asses on the sun. <laughs> and I don't remember any SUVs or factories back then. All right, so think. Connect the dots. Just in case you didn't know, the reason why the icebergs are breaking off is because NASA just came out and said the South Pole and the North Pole are volcanic regions. And that's right, you get these huge fissures that open up and they let out a million degrees worth of steam and gas and the ice melts from the bottom up. But did you get that memo? No, you were hearing about El Nino and global warming. You didn't hear about this. So NASA is saying one thing to the public and then scribbling things on the back of their ass behind you. It's true. Do the connections. And perhaps you saw this story about the ice freighter that said, hey, let's go to the Arctic. Some freaking fantastic idea. They got stuck in the ice. And the global warming scientists said, hey, we're not going to get stuck in the ice. So they sent the freighter out, another one, a bigger one, to rescue them. That got stuck in the ice. The ice was so thin. So let's do something really good. Let's take a poll. <laughs> and nine out of ten polar bears think Al Gore's full of crap. How many can give a round of applause to the polar bear? <laughs> Woo! That's what I'm talking about. All right, so yes, we are going to get more and more extreme events, but it ain't carbon dioxide. You're going to see more heat, more cold, and the reason why that's happening is because in Life Science, one of the magazines I do like, it said sun shifting magnetic fields may predict lightning strikes. <coughs> now look, a lot of people read this and they think, well, that ain't sexy, so I don't, I'm not going to really read it. It only gets about 7% of the audience. But that's how you get the edge. By looking at the real science and then making the decision based on that. Because if you're going out and farming, thinking that it's going to warm up, you're in for a big major surprise over the next decade. And remember, you're giving this information to your family too. So this is what we've finally done over the last 15 years, solar research. It goes up, down, up, down. What am I talking about? This is the solar cycle. Write it down and look it up. This is how we can all empower each other. It's the number of sunspots. And the lower the number of sunspots, the cooler the atmosphere. This is from NASA. 
1750 to 2025. The lower the sunspot number, the cooler it is. So for this side of the audience, follow along. What happened in the Ice Age? Was it cool temperatures or warm? Ice Age means usually cold, right, sir? <laughs> the little Ice Age right here is low sunspot activity. So was the Downton minimum, low sunspot activity. We are in cycle 24, and NASA is forecasting cycle 25. Now, look. I've had a little bit too much coffee this morning, but let's just do a jittery line across. It's down here, this is the peak. Remember what I said, low sunspots, low cycles, very cold temperatures. Holy mother. Wait, if this is the ice age with this one, what do you think this is? It's gonna freeze your butt so much you won't be able to sit down for three months. That's how cold NASA is forecasting it's going to get. So you see what's happening. They're calling for global warming because carbon dioxide is, you can tax a lot of this stuff coming out here and here and in your energy, but this is what's really happening. They're getting prepared for something a lot colder. This is a projection using the solar cycle. And by 2040, it's going to get five degrees colder. Now, by the way, if any of you want these slides, I realize there's a lot of information on there, come up to me, find me, I'll be here all day and evening. I'll give my card and you'll just say, hey, you sent me the slides, I'm more than happy. But it goes further, folks. We do research, this is easy to find on the internet, solar cycles. Every time the solar cycle peaks, you get a high in the market. So in 1980, 2001, 2014, the peak of the market. It's an 82% correlation between solar activity and market cycle. Here's what an interesting person told me the other day. It's Simon. The solar cycle hit in July 2014, but stocks are still going up. And I said, yeah, why is that? And he said, well, might be manipulated since July. They have an expression in Uruguay that says, ojo, ojo meaning I, watch out. Become aware, this is what I need you to be. And look at this, this is all the solar cycles, and there's an 82% correlation between solar cycles and recessions. The solar cycle prediction model is calling for a recession at the middle half of this year, quarter three. And this one says that at the bottom of each solar cycle, there is a panic. That's coming in 2019. You don't have to worry about that yet. But look, this is scientific correlation. I know it's hard to believe because you haven't seen it on CNN. But what I started doing is looking at places like Zero Hedge, C E R O Hedge.com, getting the alternative news and grouping it together and really seeing the big picture. So look, let's do a little bit of the weather. And again, you can take these slides home and look at it in the comfort of your own office. For January, February, March, there's gonna be a big shift. The plains is gonna warm up in March, and the Midwest, the eastern half, is going to get colder. The further east you go, the colder it gets. So planting in March, maybe a little bit earlier, like two to three weeks ahead of time, and then in April, May, June, even warmer up the plains. So I don't see any problems with the planting if you're west of Iowa. East of Iowa, it's going to be cooler than usual. And if we go into the summer period, a lot cooler in the plains, and I'll show you what that's about, but very, very hot up north into the upper Midwest, producing a lot of cattle stress probably. What we're noticing, folks, is, is that the further north you go, the hotter it's coming in the summer, especially over in Canada. Then, in the fall, much colder air coming down from Canada and producing a risk of getting the harvest in early. This is basically a trend that's been happening for quite a few years. Now, if we look at the January, February, March preset, it's going to be very dry over the central zone. It's not going to be a 2012, but you need to keep an eye on this 
and very wet in the east. But look at this. This is what I found very, very interesting, is that for April, May, and June, it will be very, very dry on the plains to the Midwest, and then stormy in the east. If we go into the summer, you've got basically much drier conditions in Iowa. And so, really, if you want to start saying it to yourself, this is with 80% confidence, how can I start preparing for some of these risks? Remember, the five-day forecast or the six to 10-day forecast is saying what? 30% chance of severe weather. Now, how are you making financial decisions based upon a 30% chance of anything? How are you doing it? This is what woke me up and made me drum to a different beat because I can't make a decision. If I get to 80, then I can make it. This is what these charts are all about. I do this worldwide and get these reports going in. Here we go. All right, so let's look at the top 10 weather events that I want you to know because we don't have any time to waste. How many of you know, with a raise of hands, that there's a Brazil drought going on right now? Only 17% of you. This I find amazing because it's going to affect the price of soybeans. Now, maybe not now, maybe not in the next 30 days, but the yields down there, according to boots on the ground people and farmers, is there's a lot of loss of soybeans. Now, they're also going to have flash flooding in March and February. Then, how many have heard about the California drought? That's a big one because it talks about water. Now, if you think the price of oil is going down, water prices are going up. And it's really an amazing situation because we've got drought coming into China. This is very, very important. And if you look at the news, China has just told all Chinese people, try a potato. That's right, try a potato because rice uses up too much water. That's like showing you, uh, eat sushi for lunch. How many would eat sushi? Oh, a lot of you. Great, I want people eating sushi. Maybe we can get Chinese people to eat potatoes. But basically, this is going to get bad, this drought in 2015. Now watch out, we've also got a Gulf of Mexico active season. I have not said this for eight or nine years. And that moisture is going to come into the central plains and then wrap around in the Iowa. There's also going to be crushing early cold in Canada. I feel quite sorry, in fact, for most Canadian farmers because they've got more challenges. The further north you go, the more challenge you've got because of the volatile situation in the temperatures. And again, more windstorms. So look, I realize you can't see this. This is a commodity prediction graph. The green squares are bullish. The red squares are bearish. And essentially what we're saying is, is that for all the regions on the top and all the commodities going down on the left, we're calling for a slightly bullish environment in the US for 2015. Soybeans, wheat, corn, all slightly going up by this time next year. Now a lot of people are saying bearish. But remember the equation garbage in, garbage out. How are they getting to that conclusion? We've got a lot of weather threats and a lot of planetary threats too, 2015. How many have heard of black swans? Woo, good, good. I mentioned a few of these two years ago. A black swan is a very, 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 very small event. But it has major consequences and major, major impacts. And I want to give you a few that's on my mind. How many have heard of bricks? I bet two people. One, two, whoa, surprisingly big. Wix is bad for the US dollar. I would honorably ask you to check this out. B stands for Brazil, R stands for Russia, I stands for India, C stands for China, S stands for South Africa. And those countries are getting together billions and billions of dollars to make a new bank. Well, what's this bank about? What do you think it is? Shout out to me an answer. Why are they going against the dollar? Why is China, Russia, India, Brazil, and South Africa going against the dollar? Shout it out. Okay, if nobody knows, this is what the kind of thing I'm asking you to start thinking about. <coughs> Type into Google, any other search engine, B-R-I-C-S, and you will go down an Alice in Wonderland tunnel that you will be shocked. 
These countries are getting together and they're also tying in agricultural yields. Now it gets even more interesting with even more potential black swans. How many have heard of Ebola? Everybody, why? Because they made it a huge mainstream article. And how many Americans, sad but true, died of Ebola? Very few, three maximum. And that's the ones we heard about. But it was such a huge story, how many of you were afraid to even take a plane ride to Dallas? <coughs> you see my point, garbage in, garbage out? 12,000 people die in America every winter of the flu. Let's compare things and not get sensational. Let's not get paranoid about things. These are all the labels of hemorrhagic fevers and diseases that can kill you. And look what country has the most of them. It's not Africa, it's the US. So know the right information. We will be lied to. The big question is, why? Why are they lying to us about global warming? This is the question, as a proud American for 32 years in this country, that I'm asking each one of you to start realizing and ask other people. I've got a rule, and this is another theme for the Land Expo 2015. That which is so small you cannot see, pay attention to it. The stuff that you can see, that they're telling you about, that's in the 10%. This is in the 90% range. Water scarcity, you're gonna see this more and more. How many saw the article in the Wall Street Journal about three months ago saying that there's 15,000 troops at 15,000 feet up in the Tibetan plateau between China and India? How many of you saw that article? Fine. You saw the article about Kim Kardashian's ass growing through inches, right? <laughs> this is what's happening. And that's why I'm jumping out of this bowl. There are countries in the world that have more or less water risk. And I want you to become familiar with this. China is in deep trouble. Let me show you a couple of slides here that are really interesting. You see the orange country up here. It's called the Tibetan Plateau. It's really Tibet. Most maps now that are made in China are now saying this is China. If you can find a map that's made in Germany that's four times the cost, it will actually call it Tibet. Well, this sources all the major rivers in Asia. And there's a movie called Blue Gold and the probability of water wars. Well, it's already began because like I just said to you, in November of last year, they amassed 15,000 troops up high on the Tibetan Plateau. I'm giving you information that you may not have heard about. I'm not making any of this up. It's all on the web for you to see. This is called the South to North Water Diversion Project. It's the biggest construction project by man in the world. And what they did, folks, is they moved all the water from the Tibetan Plateau. Oh, first of all, they had to secure it, militarize, you know. They had to bring in the big guns and tell India to back on down. Remember, we're dealing with two nuclear-tipped states. They moved all this water. Now, why did they start in 2008? I'll tell you why. The Chinese have been keeping meteorological records since the Hung Dynasty, something like 4,000 years ago. And every third solar cycle, they get five out of the next seven years in drought. That year just so happens to be 2015, we're in the downturn of the solar cycle, and they wanted to prep for seven years, because that is going to take a lot of work. Imagine 50 foot tunnels 50 foot wide tunnels going 3,000 miles. Well, Simon, how come I didn't hear about this on CNN, BBC, MSNBC, and Fox? Again, this is the real question. It's out here, this is what's going on, it's all in the Chinese newspapers, but this is how much you get, and then you make all your agricultural decisions based upon that. That is my theme of coming 10,064 miles. They're getting water up here, but at the expense of another country. Look at all these countries in Asia now 
that are panicking about what China's doing. They're making dams. India's making over 292, and all the other small countries, they are scared crapless about what's going to happen to their water supply. 50% of the water supply coming into India is from the Tibetan Plateau. And in case you missed the memo, China now owns the Tibetan Plateau. So what do you think India's going to do? That's scary. That's like Canada saying, we're going to cut off 50% of your water supply tomorrow because we own all the reservoirs and lakes to the north that flow south. Here it is. Wall Street Journal. India-China border standoff high in the mountains. Thousands of troops go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And we're missing this. It's a very important interconnected piece. This one is really dear and near. Talk about being global. I was born in England, and we came out on the boat, like I told you, I'm a US citizen. I worked in Japan. My wife is Japanese, and we now live in Uruguay. My kids have three passports, English, US, and Japanese. They're getting Uruguayan citizenship early next year. How's that? Four passports, all legal. By the way, if you want to have my accountant and lawyer, I'll very gladly give it to you. But four passports, all legal. We're global. We are interconnected. It's very important to know what's going on in Zambia. It's very important to know what's going on in Brazil. But this is exceptionally important to America. See, what happened, folks, March 11, 2011? March 11, 2011. Remember the date? I do. Fukushima went off. Let me tell you a real personal story, even though I'm on camera and it's recorded, because this is the truth. My wife, Japanese, born in Nagasaki, where the second bomb was dropped. Those radioactive isotopes are still active. Nagasaki is still radioactive, so is Hiroshima. They don't tell you this. But just look up the isotopes of radiation, and you'll find out that that's true. So my wife was born there from parents that were raised in that area. Her genes and DNA are not vibrating very high. She was always getting sick. We went down to Uruguay, we started doing some natural medicine, she's getting better. My point is here, this radiation leak has not stopped, and we are downwind. This nice colored stream in the north, here's India, here's Fukushima, here's the US. That is the jet stream. The southern hemisphere goes the opposite way. Here's Uruguay, here's Brazil. Get this. The two jet streams do not mix. They never meet. <coughs> so what do you think China's doing when it looks at the soybean and corn yields around the world? They are watching this. That radiation is coming downstream in the Pacific, but it's not happening in Brazil or Uruguay. So where do you think this is going to be five years from now? Look at that. Scientific American said what you should and shouldn't worry about by the Fukushima nuclear meltdown. And then I had this beautiful argument with the science guy at Forbes when he came out and said the Fukushima radiation leak is equal to 76 million bananas. And you're thinking, uh, yeah, it's bananas, it's nuclear radiation, it's plutonium and uranium is equal to bananas. We have to all wake up. I looked at this and I thought, oh my God. What is going on? These are respectable newspapers, but it's lies. Look at this, Bloomberg came out, Fukushima radiation to reach US coast at safe levels. Since when is radiation safe? And people call me, Simon, calm down and get too passionate about this. This is our kids, this is our land. And these radiation isotopes are not stopping. Look at this guy. This is the medical doctor that represents the Japanese government. His name is Mr. Yamashita. And he says, if you're smiling, you won't have any radiation effect. 
Maybe his name ought to be called Mr. Fulashita. <laughs> you know? Look, this is the Woods Hole Institute in Boston. They confirmed last November that the radiation is heading the West Coast. But let me ask you a simple question. Does the radiation just turn around at the coast and says, hey, we can't enter that, that's the United States of America? No, it keeps going. I want you to look into this, because there's a lot of stuff happening. I have one solution. I'm not all Mr. Doom. There's something out there called Humex. They were used to remove tritium from the wastewater of a nuclear power plant. I'm asking you to look into this. Let's say, God forbid, in a black swan scenario, the worst case happened, and you've got radiation coming in from Japan on your fields. If you use the Humex, it neutralizes all the radiation. So what if this is a billion dollar idea? What if it's a million idea? That your field is no longer radioactive in 2020, but Sam's is. Who's the Chinese going to buy? Who's the Brazilians or the Egyptians going to buy? Yours. Because let me tell you something scary. When I lived in Montana full time for 12 years, I had some rancher friends come up to me in Great Falls and Missoula, and they said, Simon, we've got a problem. I don't want you to go on TV like this. Give our name. But we've got our guide camera is showing a 500% increase in the radioactive counts in our wheat fields. I said, oh my God, we come up, I verified it. Folks, our playing field is changing. We need new types of thinking, and I'm imploring you, scientists or no scientists, you know what's the truth. It doesn't take a scientist or a genius to figure out there's nothing going on with global warming. We've got to start looking at the real picture. Look at this. If you can read the black circled areas, the one on the right is climate. This is the prediction for 2015. This is quite ballsy. Climate, financial crisis in the top, and water security are three interconnected themes that I think are going to be really crucial in 2015. <coughs> and you can get Google alerts, but look at what's in red. Look where the tripod, the little school with the three legs is connecting. Population. I think there's going to be some black swan. Maybe <coughs> Ebola is something similar, but it's going to affect the population. And I need you to start empowering yourself with information. New thinking, new possibilities is Hyundai's advertisement. No, I don't have a Hyundai because everybody thinks what? That it's no good. Well, get over it because they're great cars. We've got to learn the truth and look at the vision that they're putting into their manufacturing. New thinking, new possibilities. See, if you can see this, everybody's running around with a box over their head. Coffee in the morning, weather channel, get the kids to school, open up, go to work, come home, do the gym. It's the bowl. I'm asking you simply to jump out. These are my three golden rules I'm going to leave you with today. I've hopefully left you with three main ideas. Connect the dots, get real intelligence, not the fake stuff that comes out on most mainstream media, and be a global citizen and adapt to change. Look, we can all play out as play and do this spinning around on the global warming deck. But the truth is, let's get real and meet together. Namaste. Thank you. Do we have this on? Sure. Simon? You're either a genius or a quack. I'm just trying to figure out which one. That's right. That's right. I mean, you didn't give us really any middle ground, but you did add to many people's vocabulary. So thank you for that. Uh, Cannon has another microphone over there. This is a very crowded room, so we may not get to all of you. And I may have you yell out your question even to make it work, but we'd like to take a few questions. So think about them. Raise your hand, and we'll try to get to you. May I answer this first question? whether I'm a genius or a quack. 
to the US government, I'm a quack because I'm a threat. I have new ideas, new vision. They don't like this. They don't break in their ground. In Uruguay, I'm considered a genius. Why? Because I have two doctorates, humbly. One is in planetary science, one is in natural medicine. I'm a doctor. But I treat people in Uruguay using, guess what? What did they legalize in Uruguay? Well, I voted in California or Colorado. Exactly. So now, as of December 1st, and feel free to give me a round of applause, as of December 1st last year, I am now also a farmer in cannabis. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, a lot of people here are. They just don't admit and here's, <laughs> and here's the trade secret. I'm not interested in this part, the THC psychoactive element. I'm interested in the CBD element. This is how you can cure cancer. And in the AMA journal, the American Medical Association journal in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, they had low ads. Go and see them. It says cannabis oil, curing cancer. Well, get this, in the 1930s and 40s, they took them all out because chemo came in. Why? Money. It's the same reason with global warming. Follow the path of money. Let me ask you a more mundane question. California is really the number one agriculture state in the country as far as total volume of dollars. We feel like we're pretty high up there. California's had a terrible drought. Yeah. What do you think's taking place now and will take place in the future? Okay, again, our reputation is just telling the truth. You can take it or not. California is in the midst of a four-year drought. It's the worst in 125 years. It also started in April of 2011, one month after Fukushima. So I put my team on it and I said, does radiation have anything to do with drought? What happened in Chernobyl in 1986? They had three years of drought after that in that whole Ukrainian region. I said, do me a favor, get down into the books and find out what happens when radiation hits water. We were shocked. Radiation separates the hydrogen and the oxygen, the, the, the bond between water, you know, it's H2O, and the radiation separates it. What I can't prove is how much radiation is affecting the drought California, but it's certainly leading us into the right direction. And if you think I'm a nut, or if I'm a quack, ask yourself why did the EPA turn off all the radiation sensors going down the West Coast in the summer of 2011? That's what I call crazy. Question. Uh, what was the story behind the 500% increase in the radiation in Montana that you mentioned? So, yeah, everybody heard about the 500% increase in the radiation in Montana. There were some very trusted Montana wheat farmers. They heard about the Fukushima radiation and they got a $150 Geiger count. It says count per minute. And you can take these and it goes, you know, you know the sound. There's probably a Geiger count in the past five times. But essentially, their numbers have gone up almost 500% in the last three years. They don't know why. They said, Simon, this is Fukushima radiation. Is it Hanford, the radiation there in California? Who knows? The big story is, let's look at why this is happening and why it's not on the front page news. Over here, Kevin. Simon, my name is Fred Meyer. I'm Fred, from, nice to meet you, I'm sir. from Wheatland, Wyoming. Yes, sir. I'm a manufacturer and a rancher. I'm 70 years old. I want to thank you for your honesty and integrity that you met at this meeting with. I waited 70 years to hear something like this. Wow. Well, thank you very much. That's a pretty I, good uh, question. Can we give a round of applause? <laughs> you know, this takes the same courage as I get up here. I go around the world, Simon, they say, aren't you scared? No. I live joyfully. And it was the day that I got rid of that fear coming in front of all of you. 
I realize 20% of you are just gonna be like, okay, Simon, whatever, I'm just gonna go back to my homework form, and do the ball. But the important thing is, and I thank you, sir, so much for saying what you did, because that's the kind of connection, energetically, that keeps you going and being passionate. There's a question over here. You have a real interesting one. So the water tables are going down in a lot of places. Water's becoming a more scarce resource. Where's it going? I mean, it's gotta go someplace. It's not just disappearing. So where's it all going? So the interesting question from the gentleman is about the aquifers. Uh, we've got the Ogallala Aquifer going down from South Dakota to Texas. It's drying up. Two things. One of them is we are using the water, but interestingly enough, the geothermal activity across the central US is actually increasing. That means there's a more heat coming underground and it's evaporating the water. This is why you're now getting more and more earthquakes in Oklahoma. And scientists say, we don't know why. I can tell you why. It's because the thermal expansion underneath the ground is heating up and it's causing splits and cracks. So this is very, very interesting. And in China, they are actually drilling down so far to get the water because they've had so much drought. Did you get the memo last year that said Northeast and Central China had the worst drought in 63 years? You see what I mean? This is called the awakening. If you miss any of these stories, start empowering yourself again so that you can make the right decisions. I have a gentleman way back here in a red shirt. Can you just stand up and yell out your question? Is the drought in China gonna cause a lot of uh, imports from the US on corn that's coming here and how soon will they start buying? I think we're gonna get, so basically this, this, the question was, is China gonna see huge amounts of imports coming in and how busy are we gonna get? I think we're gonna get so busy in America, but we've got to keep eyes in the back of our head, meaning what's coming downstream. We're going to be pumping out so much corn and soybeans, I think, to China. They are now just saying in the news that the PRC, the Republic, People's Republic of China government, is now giving authority to local governments to fill up their grain bins. That's huge. That's a connection point saying there's more drought. And to answer your question, we are going to get very busy, but China will not be buying from us if we have, if we have radioactive corn. So my solution is, if many of us start using humates, we're going to be busy, and we're going to have neutralized corn and no radiation. Simon, I want to thank you. you uh, you're like an eagle. You soar at 40,000 feet and look down at everything and observe it from a different perspective and it's been most interesting to have you back again with us this year we thank you very much it's been my pleasure